what I love about Triumph Talks is the opportunity that I have to read incredible books and meet amazing people. I've met the author that you're about to meet today about two weeks ago, not in person, but I've been reading his life story and I have fallen in love with him. And I know that you will too. He is an overcomer of addiction and someone that even if you're not dealing with drugs, even if you're feeling outside of life or outside of society, he has some profound advice to share with you. Rory Launder felt the flip of a switch inside when he tried crack cocaine for the first time. He knew he needed more. For nearly two decades, he chased after this love, even if it meant couch hopping, living out of motels and his car, or worse, wandering the streets. When Rory was ready to turn things around, feelings of failure and shame weighed him down. However, he encountered people in his life who lifted him and gave him a sense of worth. Rory has given back to the recovery community ever since. Should Have Been Dead is Rory's first book, co-authored by Sweeta Patel, which recounts his journey from addiction and rags to healing and riches, both literally and figuratively. Rory, thank you so much for coming today. I have really looked forward to this. Thank you, Melanie. I am feel, feeling very grateful to be here and to be on your show. Thank you. <laughs> Well, you have quite a story. Like I said, I've gotten to spend a couple of weeks reading it. Um, every day I read parts of it. And so I kind of feel like you've been hanging out with me. But now this is uh, the viewer's chance to meet you as well. So let's just jump right in. I'm going to ask you the first question that I have, which is what inspired you to write this book? So what happened was the co-author, Sweeta Patel, who was working at a school here in our town of Rochester, Minnesota, where I would go in regularly and speak. And uh, she would have me come usually about twice a year. And I'd come speak to the students about addiction and recovery. And she was always so kind and would let me know, oh, Rory, the, the impact and the effect that you have on these kids. It's, we don't even know what to think. We've had students who wouldn't even connect or do any homework or do anything. And when you leave, they fill out these papers about how they connected with you and how they could relate. And, um, 10 months later at the end of the school year, they're still talking about, well, well, God, Rory, he was homeless and everything against him. And he started a business and a laundry mat where he once slept and created a million dollar business. And, and if he can do it, so can I. And in short, I think she let us let me know that the way that my story was inspiring people was amazing. And so she approached me um, as a result of a stage four lung cancer and asked me and came to me and said, Rory, oh, I think wow. I'm supposed to write your story. And uh, well, I wonder what you think. And I think she really believed, and you know, we need to be honest, that she believed that maybe I was not going to be around long. It had spread all through my body. And she thought, well, we need to, we need to get this down. And so, of course, I said yes pretty quick. I didn't, didn't wait long. And I said, okay, let's do it. And we spent two and a half years of her recording me and documenting all these stories, good and bad. And, and two uh, and a and half down. years. Wow. Yes. That's remarkable. Yeah. Oh so, goodness. and then, uh, we does that, she put it together and put it in a book. And so I, I have to be careful not to take too much credit because Sweeta did so much. And I just did a oh. lot of talking, which I sure love to do. Um, <laughs> and from it, she created this book and it's amazing. We are, we never had any agenda. We had no intention. We had nothing more than maybe creating something to continue helping these kids. And now it's Melanie, it's spread into the world. It's sold in five countries. It's, uh, um, yeah. just, we were completely, but we've sold over 4,000 copies. We've got, you know, it's, oh. uh, we don't even know what to think. I believe that there's a lot of divine intervention, um, both in, in your life and in the recording of your life. And I'm going to put a little plug in right now while we're talking about it. And that is that next week I will be interviewing Sweeta to talk about the journey of writing your story. And, and it will be an opportunity to learn more about you and your book, but also help the viewers who may be watching to learn how to do something similar. So she's coming with some great lesson plans, but you are right. She deserves huge props because she is an extremely talented writer. I just was 
um, enjoying all the ways that she captured you. She captured your voice and your personality. And it's really a, 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 a tremendous talent to be able to do that. Um, yeah. And she also has a section at the end of it where she speaks. I think it's an epilogue, if I remember right. And I love that, too, because she shares her personal life and journey and working with the kids in the schools and the troubled kids. And so I love that because we got a chance to see the spirit and the strength of the person that captured your amazing story. And so Correct. there's two amazing people on the cover of that book or two amazing names right. on the cover of that book. And yeah. with the uh, irony in our story, which wasn't planned again, was as I'm telling her my journey and all the things that I've learned and the, what I learned from others, none of them, keep in mind, were my great ideas, not nothing. But things wow. I learned from other people, men and women and people in recovery and people in uh, mental health and people in therapy people and whatever. But these lessons that I learned that really did change and alter my life, she found herself using them with the hard to reach students in her classroom and with people. And it started working. And so she's like, Rory, I'm, these things that you're telling me, I tried and they work. And then the second part is, uh, you know, Sweeta is so humble. And people mm -hmm. ask me, describe Sweeta. I'm going to tell it to you in a short <laughs> version, just so you understand the woman that she is. She has a master's degree in English literature, in English. Yeah. She could work at the University of Minnesota or RCTC at their biggest colleges in her state. I get choked up thinking about it. Oh. But you know what she does? She works at this school where everyone's given up on the kids. Um, they're out of chances, there's nothing left. And she's there working at that place, helping these kids, these hard to reach kids when she could yeah. be doing anything. So I think that says it all. She no she reading. has a career in writing. I can tell you that. There's not yeah. many writers as good as she is. And like I said, I, I really, um, I got to know you through her talent. And yeah. that's that's a real skill to be able to reach in and pull out somebody's spirit and put it on paper. And um, I loved, I loved reading your book. I am not someone that has dealt with addictions like you or, or many of your challenges. I, I don't have the, the exact challenge, but you know, life's challenges. And this is where I come from with triumph talks. I always say, you don't have to have gone through the hardship that I have. I, I started everything I'm doing because I had a baby die, a crib death. And you don't have to have lost a baby for you and I to be able to relate and strengthen each other. And so I just want all those who are watching this to know this is not just a book for addicts or at-risk youth. It's for all of us. And so, and I think that's a good segue into the second question that I have to ask you. And that is, what do you hope people will take from reading your book? When uh, the book was released, I honestly have any type of hope and I, that's again I'm just being honest I didn't you know like hey let's hope that maybe it helps these kids but now today when this question is asked as you have asked um, what I hope people take away is through the messenger the email through all the responses on Amazon that we're finding that this is helping people to shine light in these uh, tunnels that are dark where they have no hope where they've given up where they have families that are torn apart and as you said Melanie we hear responses on a daily basis on our website, on our uh, Facebook page, but of people that aren't even in addiction. They aren't, they haven't dealt with alcoholism or drug addiction or homelessness or nothing. And they're finding this to help them in ways of connection of, like you said, of whatever the this, this scenario may be, but pain about how to lift your head up and, and to keep going and don't give up, you know, an inspiring resilience, you know, motivating book that's, you know, raw, real and authentic. And uh, I hope that how it connects to these people that we hear from, that it will connect everybody like that. Because when I read those messages on the internet and on email and messenger and Facebook, it knocks us off our feet. I call Sweeta, she calls me, hey, did you read this one? Did you read that? We are so blown away by the response that now that's what I hope. I hope that it does that for more people. And it's the only reason why I'm here on your show and that I'm doing what I'm doing. People ask, well, Rory, why are you going around speaking and doing this? We're finding how much it's helping people, and that's the only thing motivating us. We have we've we've taken zero money from it. We don't profit from it. I love this part about it. People ask me, "Well, are are you making money? Are you making money from it?" 
Amazon asked us, do you want to sell your book for $17.99 or $10.99? And me and Suita looked at each other and at the same time said, $10.99. We've had a couple months where we we're in the green. We bought extra books and we put them in the prison systems. Uh -huh. So now, three years yeah. later, we've never taken a single dollar. We don't plan to at this point. And we continue to put it into the prisons, halfway houses, treatment centers, um, run around and I travel and speak and we don't, I don't receive anything people have offered to pay or to have me come out. And, um, uh, I, I will be accepting my first hotel paid for in <laughs> October and that's it. And I'm like, you said seven months. Well, so by tell me if in Texas. In. I want you to come to Texas. That's where I'm at. Awesome. <laughs> tell me if you come to Texas, maybe I'll arrange it. I love it. Wow. That's, cool. that's wonderful. Well, I want to take a minute. If you don't mind, I grabbed it. I had your book on my shelf over here. And I've just grabbed it. And I want to just take a little bit of time now to share what I took from your book and just to give the viewers an opportunity to really get a feel for, for the content itself, if you don't mind. I could spend hours just sharing pieces of your book and asking you for all of your insights. And so, but I'm going to just do it with a few. So the first one is I just was amazed by this description of what it's like to use drugs because I, I haven't used them and I'm sure people who have will, will appreciate how well you articulate what that is like. Um, and so I'm just going to read a little bit here and then I'll let you speak to it. It says, that's what's scary about drugs. You never know what your body will love in that moment. And then you'll do anything to keep that high going. It was like finding the perfect woman made just for me who gave me exactly what I wanted how I wanted it every single time. But I always came down, and when it was over, I was left grieving a broken relationship. What I love about that is, even for somebody who has never used drugs, to be able to understand the drug addict, which I think is extremely important. I think all of us can know how painful a broken relationship is. And I think that begins to give us all a feeling of how painful this... Um, this whole experience can be at least when you're, when your drugs have worn off. Yeah. When you're active and it's again and again, and it's over again and again. And you know, the, the world, I always say when I do a podcast that I want them to know is uh, um, there's something in us that clicks and I can be in a room with 10 people, Melanie, and nine people look at their clock and be like, Oh, it's getting late. I got to get going home. But me and maybe if it's a room of 100 people, there's one other person. We're looking at each other like, oh, no, we need to go get some more. So there's something different. And, and to be able to say, oh, just put it down, quit drinking, quit doing mm -hmm. that bad behavior, quit feeling sorry for yourself. It's not always that simple for everybody. Everybody's made a little bit different. But I realize there's something in me that clicks. And, and the problem is what people realize what I'm up against is what you just read. I have something in my life that will make me feel great that makes all the pain go away, the hurt from the loss of a child or, or the, or, the, you know, for me, I lost all my family members. And in a four year period, I lost my mother, my father, my best friend, and my grandpa, the four people that were the most important people to me in the world passed away. And so people would come to me and they'd say, Rory, it's okay. God don't give you more than you can handle. And I'd look them in the eye and say, you know what? You're telling the wrong guy that. How are you mm -hmm. going to look me in the eye and tell me that? How, if God knows me, how would he let this happen to me? And I didn't realize that what I realized today, that it was just part of my journey. And you know what, that, uh, you know, it was mm. just people die and it just happened the way that it did. And I have a choice how to respond to it. Just like we do with everything in the world, whatever it is, I still have a choice. As long as I'm breathing air and I'm sober, Melanie, I have a choice how I can respond to it. You know, I can let it carry. I can let it bother me. It can be a week from now and I can still be complaining about it, going to bed at night, staring at the ceiling with it still in my mind up to hours past my bedtime. How do I choose to carry it? And this recovery and these programs and this life that I've lived have taught me how to let things go, how to give it away, how to how to carry it on, how to deal with it, how to mourn, how to do make traditions out of something bad. Instead of like Thanksgiving in the book, you read it like, oh, my God, it's the only holiday in my family. God, it's so bad. When one of my mentors said, you know, what? if you weren't feeling so sorry for yourself, maybe it won't be so bad. And I thought, God, what an ass. What an ass. Who said I was emotionally opened up to this guy. And he says some shit like that to me and throws it in my face. What an unheartful, what a horrible person. <laughs> and today I created a tradition. He said, why don't you go? You said you were a chef. Why don't you go give some food to these places that all helped you? Talk about all these places that helped you. Melanie, for, four, for 14, 15, 15 years, I've been making fruit trays and bringing them to all these places. 
for 15 years and they sit and they wait for me every year and I go in there and now Thanksgiving, because I created a tradition, this is a great example. Um, it's my favorite holiday again. I love it. I look forward to it every year. I get excited. I buy fruit. My whole kitchen is full of shit. <laughs> my wife just shakes her head at me. <laughs> and it started with like two or three and now there's like 10 and, uh, there's nowhere to even to put the trays or fridges are full. So I put them outside. Thankfully it's in November uh, and it's cold out. So I am on the deck and, uh, it is the most wonderful thing. And that's if anything I can leave here today, anybody with is that you can take a negative and you can turn it into a positive. I have. And, uh, even though I still miss my family and I miss my mother and I miss Thanksgiving, I have a Thanksgiving tradition. I do now. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And uh, it's a perfect example of that. I'm so glad you brought that up because, well, first of all, it's only one of a long list of examples in your book of ways that you have taken what you've been through and you've helped others. And there's so many times when you have given that same tough love to those that you sponsor. You would sponsor a tremendous amount of people at one time. And it was for yourself too, because you knew that if you had any free time at all, you might go looking for that rock. And so yep. you oh, just I'm nuts. Yeah. You have yeah. become a helping machine. I mean, you are hustling in such positive ways, but it took you a while to get there. And that's um, so I want to read another excerpt that gives people an idea. You are you're so strong, you're even though you've been dealing with cancer. Um, or overcome it. You're so healthy in so many ways. But here's a little description of what you once looked like. <laughs> it says, um, I caught my reflection against a glass window and moved closer. I turned to my side and lifted my shirt a few inches. I probably only weighed 100 pounds. I traced the deep grooves in my cheeks before pulling my lip up over my gums. I stared at the gaps where my teeth used to be now littered with metal posts, and ran my finger over the jagged edge of a crooked tooth. When people asked me later if I had one wish, I would say, I just want to be able to smile. I spent decades hiding my teeth behind a hand when I talked, or as I begged strangers for spare change. What a visual. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, a long way. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I, they, uh, I got a whole yeah, that beautiful of, uh, smile. <laughs> yeah. And uh, to have that confidence, you know, that's uh, another thing. I'll, I'll try and speak quick. I, I know I go off track, uh, but, uh, yeah, great. Okay. you know, people that live, that are homeless, that live in the streets, and I often say this, and I will share it again, because I think it's profound and people need to understand it, or at least I'm one, and maybe it's a result of the cancer. And I always, give credit to that in what foolish way it may be it's the truth but because uh because of cancer it's motivated all this the book and even my thinking and sharing being willing to share people ask yeah. me regularly like rory do you really share it at all and i'm like you know what i've got stage for lung cancer i don't care i don't care that's what i told sweet i looked in the eye and I, she said i think i'm supposed to write your story and i said okay and i excuse my language but i looked her back in the eye i want to give you the moment and I said, okay, I'm going to tell you my story, but I'm going to fucking tell you everything. And I she said, it. okay. And so I did. <laughs> and so, uh, um, you know, we know, so to finish that first part, we know that uh, people that are homeless, we know that we look different, Melanie. We know that we're dirty. We know that our fingers are dirty and our clothes is strewn. We know that. And it doesn't justify it, make it good or bad, or looking for sympathy for homeless people. But we know that. I just want people to understand this. So it's all the harder for us to have confidence to come up out of the ditch where we're yeah. at. Like, oh, why don't yeah. you just quit drinking? So even if we quit drinking, we're still a felon. We look like shit. I have no teeth. I can't smile. You want me to go in and try and get a job at the lumber yard and sit there with confidence and a dirty shirt with whatever? And I realize I put myself there, but I just want the world to understand but that's where our mind is too. So it takes a minute. Not only do we have to get off our addiction or even someone not in addiction, someone who's riddled with a uh, mental illness, someone's that uh, riddled with depression, someone that's riddled with anxiety. Not only do we have to get through that, but then we also have to get some confidence back and by these relationships in this mentoring and helping. And people ask me all the time, Rory, what can I do to help? You know what? I'll give an answer. Go down to the shelter one day a week or a month, just one day, just one mm -hmm. day a month. You can't, you know, giving them $10 on the side of the road, don't do that. 
Don't mm-hmm. do that. And all the homeless people, they're going to hate me for this, but I don't care. I say this <laughs> again, again. Don't even give them a nickel. Nothing. Mm-hmm. If you have time, run back to Burger King if they're hungry and give them a sandwich. You know, yeah. you got to think that's that's my brother. That's my sister. Would it would, would I would my higher power want me to feed them today? He would. So you know what? I, I would do that. But don't give money. And people say, what should we do? We can't save everyone. But if people start helping and volunteering them more, because when I was in these shelters, like you read, when I was in the Dorothy Day, when I was at the Ronald McDonald Hospital, I would meet these people and they were kind to me and whatever. And that started to lift me. That started to get me to walk with my chin up, even though I still had to hide my teeth. I still had a little, I had a little skip in my step. I started to feel good about myself. And that helped me to become the man I did. And to go from a homeless drug addict in my town that I still live in today, where the police that arrested me and told me I had to get out of the laundromat, uh, Donnie Bray and Lisa Sheridan, two retired police officers in a town, who later, once I created my company, had me do multiple tens of thousands of dollar jobs on their homes. The same guy, the same homeless guy that they used to arrest, Melanie. This is like, I love this. And, then, uh, chance. and then to be doing work for them. And so- yeah. People can change. And when people look at homeless and they look at people drug addicted and people riddled and, and, and you know, camps and whatever, people can change. They, it can. And I know the last uh, speaking engagement I had, I spoke to a gentleman. He said, you know, the numbers, I, I'm a rarity. Maybe, you know, it's not a lot, but at yeah. least if I can still prove that, but it can happen. You know, just like the little girl on AGT that says, well, you know, miracles can happen. You know, miracles can happen. She's yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. Give people the chance. You know, what you just said is so perfect because my next excerpt is is dealing with what you just talked about. So we, we got a little divine intervention in our in our interview here. All right. So speaking about the people that helped you, you here's a, a little excerpt that says, these people came into my life almost like mile markers of hope. The kid at the Ronald McDonald house. Sunday was sunny. Mondays with Mary, Eric and Steve and walking arm in arm. Each moment lifted me a little more and a little more till I stood erect with the trust and faith they had in me. These were the greatest moments in my life and each one saved me with my head down. They would have passed me by. So just what you were saying, the the difference that these individuals made. But you know, another thing I took from it really is the beginning of it, I think, was the people who had faith in you and gave you a chance. But then I I would say I I see a stage where you shifted and you became the servant of other people before you were well completely, before you felt like you didn't have to run any free second you had to go get high. You filled your life with service and you made a huge difference in other people's lives. And And I truly believe that is the greatest triumph that comes out of our adversities is just being able to help people so powerfully because you are one of them and you're, you're, you're not all the way there, but you're ahead of them and you're already turning down, uh, turning around and lifting up the next person. Yes. They taught us early on that uh, one person can best connect with another that you can relate to. So when someone's speaking and they're talking about, the loss of a child, about drug addiction, about mm-hmm. homelessness, about whatever um, that their situation is. Um, although we can go to college and learn about it and become very connectable in, in a sense, but that person that's been there, it's tough to really uh, argue that. And I think these kids in these schools, um, that's what these teachers in these uh, health classes, English literature classes, like when I come to these high schools is yeah, these kids are so smart but they can't argue with it. You're right there standing in front of them. You were able to change even with everything against you. You still created a life for yourself. So as they sit and argue with teachers and I'll never, I can't, I won't, I'll Mm -hmm. never be able to, you come in and it just shuts them all up. And they're like, well, shit, if he can do it, so can I. And the wonder, (laughs) my favorite part about myself that I love God for is that, you know, I might have a nice shirt on right now, but I still dress in a sweatshirt and I I don't talk (laughs) perfect. I wiggle a lot. Sometimes I swear a little too much. And uh-huh. honestly, in the world that I live in, it makes me more approachable. The more proper and right that I get, it makes me unreachable. And so, and I don't have to try and stay down and dress dirty or whatever. That's not my point. But if mm-hmm. I just remain myself, because being myself is what made it where I could connect with all these people. And now it's like I'm connecting with people in the world and it's blowing me away. Uh, Unreal. 
I love it. I love it. Well, my next excerpt, excerpt from your book is something that I, I don't know if you can see this. I, 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 I make a mess of books. I, I just study them. I got highlight and I got writing in the margins. Anyway, this is just phenomenal advice here that I'm about to read. And I, I wrote what I wrote in it. I wrote great advice for us all. So here it is. It says a, a friend of ours quickly chimed in, play the whole story out. Don't just stop the movie at what's going to happen if I take this one drink, play it all the way through. The whole story would go like this. If Steve had that one glass, he wouldn't stop. He'd keep drinking till he passed out or blacked out or ran out. Eventually, he'd lose his wife, his kids, and his home. There was a time when staying sober for even a week seemed impossible to him. And of course, this is somebody that you, you were serving. That time had brought him to his knees, begging for help in his tiny basement apartment. These days, he worries about which bathroom sink fixture would look nicer in the four-bedroom home he owns. Today, he would know what it was like to lose if he ever chose to pick up a drug or drink again. And if he loses what he has today, he says you might as well put him in the gutter. The end. Now, the reason I think that is so important for us all, not just for somebody who's trying not to use again, the idea of play it all the way out. I think too often in life, we make impulsive decisions and that can be bad for us, whatever they are. And, and in those moments, if we'd stop and just play out the whole story and, and say, oh, actually, that's not the path I want. But too often, I don't think we go to the end enough. And I, I just think that's such great advice. Would you expound on that a little more? I think for people that have gone back and forth, especially if it's a situation that we've been through before, you know, for those of us, any of it, even if it's being angry, being mad, um, you know, uh, loss, death, you know, play the story out is, you know, we kind of know, like for me as an addict and in Steve's case, we kind of know what's going to happen. And by doing that, it makes me think about it, like, hey, do I really want to do this? Do I want to make that choice? It's like reaching for the cookie jar and stopping myself and, and like, oh, hold on a minute. And so in some of the recovery stuff, we use a, a, a paragraph that says uh, pause when agitated or discontent. So I know from my past, if I'm angry, if I'm, uh, you know, any kind of emotion involved that, you know what, I need to maybe sleep on it and don't make a decision because my history shows, and this is just me getting older and starting to be honest with myself. Um, I know that uh, um, if I make a quick decision, if I'm angry or hurt or, or vengeful or someone comes at me, my, my natural ability is to reality, retaliate, retaliate back, that I have to be careful with that, that my history shows, my past shows, I haven't done well doing that. So sometimes weirdly I have to be like, well, I can't make that decision right now. I'll have to sleep on it tonight. Or if it's an argument or something where I feel like I've been hurt or taken advantage of, it's like, don't say anything. And I sit and think about it for a day or two. I do this often with stuff. And really think it through. And then uh, again, by doing it, I think, God, thank God I didn't react to that. Because uh, when it first happened, everything that was going through my head wasn't good. you know. And that's why there's there's proof in it that shows me that uh, I'm glad I didn't react because I was pissed. And then it's a day later, I'm thinking, you know, Rory, it's not really a big deal in the big picture. Or maybe it's something that is. And I need to go somewhere else. Like maybe I need to go see a therapist. Maybe I need to see a doctor. Maybe mm -hmm. I need to sit down with my wife or maybe I need to, but I got to just, you know, pause. I got to pause. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm a reactor. I like to just react to things. But again, my history shows that Rory reacting to things doesn't go well. Yeah. So, when you stop and think about what's going to, what's going to be the end result of me saying this right now. I, I just think that's such great advice, but I'm glad that you mentioned your wife because um, that's actually the next uh, excerpt, but I want to set it up first. Um, and talk about her. And then I have something from, from the book about her. Um, your wife is absolutely gorgeous. In fact, when I saw a picture of her, I thought, is she an actress? Have I seen her before? <laughs> you know, she just has that look about her. That's just, um, I, I'm sure that, uh, everywhere you go, people stop and stare and she, but she's just, um, amazing. And, um, but, and unbelievable to me, she had her own journey of addiction and you were both, I guess, dealing with it when you met hers being alcohol. Um, and she is just, 
I loved getting to know your life and getting to know about her. I'm so grateful that you shared what you did. Would you just talk about her a little bit? And then I want to read something from your book. That's a tough one. Talk about her a little bit. I think that's impossible. Um, you know, God works in mysterious ways. That's all I can explain is because uh, I, too, I look at her and I wonder, well, why is she with me? She is so beautiful, Melanie, on the inside and the outside that I wonder, I tell myself, joking, that don't mess this up. But uh, the, the the life that we've been able to build together, um, I am so grateful for. She is so patient and loving with me. And through everything, the book now and recovery and the early days, and to have someone to be with that I enjoy to be with, that enjoys being with me, that we love to do things together. We uh, we do everything. We fit people. I was just another time. So your wife fishes with you? Yeah, we fish all around the world. We love fishing. Um, we've been married almost 11 years, which for someone like me is another miracle. Um, I never maintain a relationship uh, in my drug using for any period of time. Of course, with sobriety, that came. But um, I'm just grateful for her. I love her to death. She's beautiful. And we uh, we like hanging out with each other. We do stuff. And irregardless of my job and all the things that I do, and I have a couple businesses right now that I'm starting because my cancer is not doing anything. And I'm yeah. figuring, well, I guess I'm going to live a while. I better just get a job again. But uh, <laughs> I'm glad every, to hear you're doing well that way. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, but a uh, miracle. But uh, every night, no matter what, at five o'clock, I'm home and she's home and we're together every single night. Yeah, wow, I, you, I adore my wife and I love her very much. You you truly have that sort of fairy tale ending in in that sense. Um, but she went through her own very difficult uh, addiction where she would be in the ER over and over and over again with alcohol poisoning. And I know her parents worried about her. And, and, and at the beginning of your relationship, you really were helping each other to stay sober for each other. Um, but what I wanted to share from your book that I really loved was was actually something that she had that um, her name is Lily. I don't know if we said that. But so it says Lily saw a new message written in blue marker on the whiteboard above Margie's desk. You are what you do, not what you did. And I just oh, I love that. And I love that she noticed it. And I, I'm sure she's just as dynamic and amazing as you are. She needs to write a book so we can have her on the show too. <laughs> um, so you are, as I said at the beginning, you are a, a rags to riches story. It's kind of remarkable because you were on the streets and you talk about going into the laundromat and sitting by the dryer just to try to warm up. And then later on you bought that same laundromat and I um, actually have a picture of it here. And uh, I wonder if you'd share a little bit about just uh, the journey of becoming uh, a very wealthy person after all that you've been through. And let me bring up the picture here real quick. You want to talk about this a little bit, what we're looking at? So that first little building in the front is actually a bait store. It was a bait store where they sold bait out of. To the right was the laundromat. And then behind the two buildings were apartment buildings. And by the time I had been diagnosed with cancer and decided to sell my business and everything, I had owned all those buildings. So what's ironic is uh, I started my business in that little lawn, in the little bait store in the front, the little shed. And it was like 10 feet wide by 16 feet long. And there's a little sign on the roof that like that back sign by the truck there says Rory's Home Improvement. I put that on there and I worked out of that little shed for God, almost a year when the lady approached me and said, hey, the laundry mat's gonna be for sale. Would you be interested? And she didn't know the backstory or anything. And I thought, oh, my God, would I? I used to sleep in that same place. So eventually, over time, um, we met and I found a bank that was willing to work with me. And uh, there's a whole storyline behind that, but I won't give all that out. It's in the book. Yeah, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I ended up buying the laundromat and creating a business that was doing over a million dollars every year in siding, roofing, and windows. And uh, I don't like to really use the term riches or that I'm rich. I'm not. Yeah. My most wealth comes from my sobriety. My wealth comes from my beautiful wife to have a partner in life that loves and adores me, that likes to be with me daily, that doesn't need breaks and all that kind of different stuff over my life I've seen. Um, but that's where my wealth comes from. And then this monopoly of people in my town, there's so many people. When I got sick <laughs> with uh, cancer, oh my God, I would come home 
there were signs in my yard and the door was full of stuff, food, oh. Tupperware, cookies. And uh, people would come in my business there in the laundry mat. And they're like, are you the Rory that's sick? And I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, well, every Sunday at my church, the whole church is praying for you. And this was a half dozen people. So a half mm. dozen churches. I don't even attend a church in my town. So all the towns praying. Um, <laughs> all these people came out of the woodwork. People say, oh, you know you're for who your friends are when whatever. It was the opposite. There was so much stuff and people and calling and Facebook and all this stuff that uh, sometimes I started to feel like, God, I wonder if I'm even worthy of this. Like maybe I wow. need to do more. But uh, I've never I'm... seen or experienced anything like that in my life. I was absolutely humbled by the care and compassion and concern and love of everybody. And they went on the journey with me. And they I love the juxtaposition that you're creating or that you're sharing, you know, because I brought up these people want to know, you know, we're, we're all curious how you went from sitting in a laundromat, just homeless on the streets to owning it. And of course it wasn't a lawn, not, you didn't run it as a laundromat, but there's the, the, um, the materialistic, how do I get ahead? Mine wants to hear about it, but I love that you turned to that to say, but the true riches are the people and the love and the yeah. prayers. And you know what? I love that because isn't that the truth? That is the riches of life. Yeah, the laundry mat, that was just the motivation of uh, mm -hmm. my energy that got that. And mm -hmm. I tell people, especially specifically in addiction, we show in our addiction, Melanie. Oh, my God. Have you ever seen a drug addict or alcoholic? Have you seen their abilities? They hide and sneak and get more money in this. They got some <laughs> yeah. skills. They know how to uh, regulate, manipulate, organize, you know, this, <laughs> transfer money, whatever, this, and hustle. Use whatever words you want. So what I did is I took those same abilities and I put them into something positive. That's it. And, the, and here's the hope for the rest of the world. I didn't go to college. I didn't even finish high school. I went back mm. in my first treatment and got my GED. But my ability, my drive to get up and what I did is I was able to get that drug seven days a week, you know, 24 hours a day, whatever. And, and that's like these men and I sponsor in recovery. They get sober up a little bit and they get going and they get their first little job and they're like, oh, man, I got to work eight hours today. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, God. dude. You're bitching about it. You used to get high for, you told me a story about getting high for four days straight and you're on meth, didn't sleep. <laughs> and you know how much work that down. took. <laughs> yeah, no car, walking in the snow. And now you're bitching about a little eight hour shift. You better check yourself. I love that. Be honest with yourself. So you've shown, you know, you have these abilities. Just use them rightly. And that's the great thing. That's what I did. I had no, I had no family. People are like, how did you, were you able to buy a building, a commercial property and do all this? Like you said, uh, people in the world want to know, um, drive. I went, I just kept going. And you know what? On Sunday night at, you know, 435, people in town would drive by and they'd be like, Rory, you weren't working, were you? Because my business was on the main drag in the middle. Of, you weren't there Sunday working, were you? I'm like, yeah, because my truck would be right out front. And I'm like, yeah, I was. <laughs> So if you, you just work, you're too crazy. I'm like, well, it's a good thing for me to keep busy. You know, it's a good thing for yeah. me to keep busy. And, and it's also good to have balance. And I've had to learn that over time. But early on, you know, with my head consumed, whether it be addiction, mental health, worry, anxiety, depression, whatever, when I find myself busy with, this, with something, I don't find myself sitting focused on it. When I yeah. go home and sit alone and I'm sitting there with my, sitting in my room, well, what do you, of course that's going to happen. Go out and do something, take a walk, get on a bike, go do this, go do that, just go do something. And it doesn't hear it, but it's a heck of a good start. And that's the, and that's the great advice that I think is especially important for anyone who's watching this that is dealing with addiction to say, look at the skills you have now, put them to that. And, and, uh, you've got such a bright future. Yeah. So I want to back out now and, um, ask you the next question. And that is, how did you come up with the title and the cover of your book? So again, it was uh, between Sweden and I. We both did. We worked on it together. Um, we had some different things. We had uh, White Boy Fred. We had, that was my name in the street. We had a ton of different things. But uh, I honestly stayed pretty open. I told Sweden again and again throughout this whole process. What do you want to see? What, uh, what, what do you like that? You know, she would ask me what I think I would throw interject a little bit, but I was always kind of tiptoeing and careful because it, to me, it was her baby. She approached me and I wanted to give her that final decision and let, let her have a, 
you know, she put in all the work, the, the writing, you know, in reality, I just talked, she filmed and I talked and she would uh, involve me in some of the and stuff, but I wanted it really to be truly her. And after a whole project, and when you meet with her, she'll tell, tell you it. I mean, we twisted and moved it over and centered it and up. And then the picture of the laundromat with the sun just coming up and a guy carrying a bag or a backpack with the hood up, that was like, when I seen the picture, the cover, I broke down. I got fully emotional before there was even wording on it. I'm like, this is amazing. And this was uh, a, a, a Mr. Pentagrass that was in, uh, I think he's in Ireland. So it was unbelievable how he came up with that and how everything worked out. And uh, yeah. I love it. And you, it, again, all these divine interventions that you would find the perfect cover, the perfect silhouette and the perfect location love the sun coming through whether it's a sunrise or a sunset it's just there's something glorious about that so you have the colors the greens and the grays that kind of convey the the dark side of addiction and then you have the sun rise or set that conveys that you know light is coming it's just it's a very provocative in a good way cover i love your cover and then your title can you kind of share a little bit how you settled on that um we get the true story part we both uh thought that was wonderful but uh she came up with it should have been dead it was a uh, sweeta who came up with it and uh i thought it sounded wonderful um we even went back and forth on the lessons from a crack addict who broke free do we have it do we don't and uh she had was really had liked it and i said that's fine i love it i love the cover um and a lot of the times she would send me three or four different things and then me, they all look good. Whichever one you want, I would tell you decide. And then she'd kind of, she wouldn't get upset, but she'd let, she would let me know, well, you're not really helping, you know, in a jokingly way. Like if I, me saying, oh, whatever you want, she's like, well, I want you to like say which one. So then I would kind of carefully tiptoe in and uh, agree or suggest a little towards one. But I was always careful because I, I can't speak enough that, for me, when I started seeing this happen and come together, Melanie, I don't even know what happened within me. Like my brother, Tim said it the best. I think he said, Rory, now you have a legacy of your life. And when we got this first book and I was holding it and uh, there's a little video on Facebook and I'm holding it and I'm kissing it and smelling it. And, you know, like the little weirdo that I am, but it was <laughs> a moment because that's how I felt. I looked at it. It was glossy. I'm like, holy crap, this is real. Like this is messed up. And uh, yeah. I don't know if I have 10 days left to live. And I don't know if I have 10 years. I have stage four lung cancer. It's very serious. It's in my blood mm -hmm. and my bones. It's non-small cell carcinoma. Um, uh -huh. It's uh, it's not going to go away. But to know that this has happened, like I'm so at peace. The only thing I can think about is my daughter and my God kids and my wife. But as for me, I'm good. Yeah. I have achieved, overcome, been an example, proven to the world, to the people in it, and given hope and inspired people everywhere that you can change, that whatever it is you're going through, you do not have to let it define you. And yes, it's going to take some work. And it might take some being honest and putting stuff out on the table and looking at it and dissecting stuff. But you can change and you get to decide how the story goes. The world doesn't or whoever's in your life or whatever it is, you get to decide what's going to happen next. And you can start to choose these things. And I love that. That for me, that's what really gets me excited. And so I'm at peace. I've achieved and done that. everything. Uh, if, if God said, you know, Rory, tomorrow you're going to walk down to the river here behind your house and you're going to walk in the river and that's it. This is your last day. I'm okay. I'm not upset. I'm not mad at God. Um, I don't feel cheated. Uh, I have never been more at peace and i can't th ever think sweet enough but with this happening um it's done something to me it has eased my fears it has eased my you know any regrets or nothing there are none i've made amends i've said things i've went to people I've, I've people when this book released a girlfriend a couple of them from way back in the day where i might not have been right came out of the woodwork and hey this is so and so i'm like no way and i even wrote a little letter back hey you know when i was wrong the way i treated it, oh it's okay and they're married and have kids and they're happy as can be but to, but to really release myself of all those things even things that you know i did, forgot about to be able to be clear and clean of everything that's the gift it's not a sad story it's not sad that i have cancer 
I, I've been given this little bit of time and I've been able to, I think, use it rightly. I've used it rightly, not to get more stuff or see what I can do for me, but to go out and help the world. Like you said, I'm a, I'm a servant, you know, I'm, I'm doing, uh, doing, being of best service as I can to God and those around me and the people around me. It's not about me anymore. It's not about my, what I can get or what I can do. Yes. I keep busy. I have to keep doing things. You know, I'm Rory. So I have to have probably 20 things going on, but um, I am so blessed. I've been so fortunate and so lucky. And I tell people, whatever you believe in, whether it's Buddha, Allah, God, Jesus, Moses, Great Spirit, doesn't matter. I've sponsored men and uh, mm. with all mm. kinds of different beliefs and different stuff. And as long as there's something, as long as you have some type of spirituality or something, I think that's going to give you some hope to have a reliance on something that's not, you know, you know, another human being or money or, you know, things like that. But to have something like I look at it like this, I have a reliance on something greater than me. That's never going to let me down, never going to yeah. leave me. It's not going to give up on me. It's not going to tell me I'm shitty or I'll never be nothing that no matter what, if I'm sitting in jail, even if I use again, if I make a bad choice or whatever, that he'll always be there with me, no matter what, to know that I'll never be alone. That gives me power that empowers me and gives me strength to be the person that I am today no matter what, no matter what comes. Well, and you know, I am my, my mission in life really is to help people to share their stories. Um, I'm an indie publisher, so I've published a lot of books. I've ghostwritten books. Um, and I love what you just said. And I, I really kind of, I think you just answered my last question, which I didn't even ask it, but which is what advice you have for aspiring authors. Um, and I, I just really believe, I want everyone who's watching this to, to take this away. This is the takeaway that I hope that you have. And that is that sharing your story is one of the greatest gifts that you can give the world. I yes. really believe that. And what you have just described is the evidence of that belief um, because you, you you are going to die someday. We all are going to die someday. And if we don't leave our legacy and leave our wisdom and, and leave our, our stories of bad things we did and what we learned from it behind, we're taking so much treasure, so much riches with us. And when you put it into a book, and I believe, I'm of the opinion, everyone needs to preserve their stories. I, I don't think you have to be a drug addict who's who's in your position now to be someone who's got a story to tell. Um, I just really believe that we all need to tell our stories. And, and, and of course, that's a great segue <laughs> into introducing uh, an episode that I'll be filming next week with your author, Sweeta Patel. She's gonna be coming on Triumph Talks and talking about her journey, writing your story and really breaking it down for people so that if somebody has somebody they love or that they recognize with an important story to tell, like she did with you, they can come to this episode and learn how to do what she did. From And I've seen her notes already. She's preparing. She's a teacher. So she's yes. got amazing lesson plans already. So this is my chance to kind of pitch that episode. And um, I think it's going to be really great. I hope that people who are watching you and hearing you today will come back and meet her. And I'm sure that they will. So do you have any final advice that you'd like to give for anyone that might be interested in sharing their stories? Raw and real and authentic as you can. Be less concerned with what the world's going to think and judge than just being honest and true. And it's a high mound to step over to do that. But believe in that. That's what, if I could give advice, believe in it. Because um, I don't want to say that's what's going to differentiate the story, but people, um, but that's what's going to make it truthful and real. And uh, so I've had to share in my journey things that I didn't care to. But I think that's what made the difference with it. I really do. You're authentic. There's a lot of F word in it. <laughs> because you were showing people who you are, who you were. And who you are, which is which is just somebody that connects with all walks of life, and um, and so I didn't, I was not bothered at all by it, not at all, and um, and I think you know somebody going into it that understands your um, personality and um, 
you know, the vernacular that you use from, from the different walks of life that you've been in. I think they'll really appreciate that you were yourself no matter what. And you really are getting your full, honest story in this book. And so, yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I Like I said, it's been... I've been looking forward to it every night that I would read a chapter in your book. I just would think, ah, oh, cannot wait for this interview. So it's been, it has been a joy and I thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, Melanie. I um, could never appreciate you enough for doing this. <laughs> I really do um, to allow us, Sweet and I, to help share this with the world is mm. become an amazing journey and thank you for being part of it. Oh, uh, well. It's what I do and it's what I love. So thank you for this joy. <laughs> Thanks.